Um, actually, I'd prefer to spend some time on this. Uh, John Bolton was speaking with Jake Tapper. And uh, look, this is so interesting because this whole effort towards this Venezuela coup and threats of invasion. First of all, look at Trudeau and the, and the, the pseudo-woke, scandal-engulfed Canadian government. Trudeau signed up on efforts at regime change in Venezuela, but has been, uh, I believe, photographed with the Haitian president who organic, non-outside engineered interests are demanding he be removed. Haiti has one of the most important social movements happening in the world today right now. Go to the TMBS channel and watch the history of it with France Francois. And again, there's organic opposition inside Venezuela, and the Venezuelan government has absolutely committed abuses. There's no doubt. Ken Silverstein just wrote a really good report there from the New Republic. He's like, look, made plenty of mistakes. On the other hand, the talk of crisis is manufactured and made up. And most Venezuelans, even if they oppose Maduro, do not want a U.S. engineered regime change. This should not be that complicated to figure out. The Trudeau the resistance people, the people who are so naive that somehow they're able to rightly say that Donald Trump is a racist monster who rips children out of their parents' arms, all of a sudden, oh, no, but no, in Venezuela, I mean, obviously, that would be the one case where, of course, there's genuine human concern here. And as evidenced by the fact that his his point person is literally a ghoul going back to the 1980s who has done spin and cover for every type of death squad and mass murder available, imaginable in Latin America, not to mention also tremendously harmful work in the Middle East. Of course, I'm talking about Elliot Abrams. At least this administration, you know, uh, Amber Lee Frost had a great piece about why leftists don't like the New York Times, but we like the Financial Times. And the one of the things she said was she said, you know, the New York Times doesn't know that we're in a fight. Financial Times is on, I'm paraphrasing here, the Financial Times, they're on the different side of it, but at least they know we're in conflict here. So yeah. don't listen to the nonsense, you know, Bill and Hillary Clinton tweeting out, you know, oh, but it's time for the Venezuelan people and blah, 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 all this nonsense. This is John Bolton telling you, exactly what is going on with U.S. policy in Venezuela. Good to hear, but do you, do you not see that uh, the United States support for other brutal dictators around the world undermines the, the credibility of the argument you're making? No, I don't think it does. I think it's separate. And I think, look, in this administration, uh, we're not afraid to use the phrase Monroe Doctrine. This, this is a country in our hemisphere. It's been the objective of American presidents going back to Ronald Reagan to have a completely democratic hemisphere. I... There you go. Wow. I think the word he was actually looking for was capitalist hemisphere. Well, well, and also, you know, the Tapper sure is right to point out the hypocrisy, but the appropriate follow-up question, which uh, Tapper did not ask, is what about literally, you know, I mean, again, over 49 coups, death squads, you, your point person on Venezuela was lied to Congress about Iran-Contra, was involved in covering up some of the worst massacres in human history in El Salvador, a genocide in Nicaragua. How does that fit? Uh, but Bolton, it, he said it. I mean, the first point was the important point. This is the Monroe Doctrine. It's our regional imperial hegemony. That's what this is about. And that's why, again, in a broader conversation, of course there should be a serious analysis of Venezuela. And of course anybody who tells you that there's no problems there and there's no corruption, there's no abuses, is either being tremendously naive or hugely ideological or lying. But at the same time, you need to recognize the, the strategic context of what a U.S. intervention is. This is a U.S. government that even under Obama was already backing a coup in Honduras that removed a, a moderate Manuel Zelaya that culminated in the um, assassination of, of Alberta Cartanis in 2015 by paramilitaries in a Honduran a, a far-right government backed by us. This is a government that participated and backed the lawfare that made Lula a conciliatory a social democrat who managed to deliver huge things for the Brazilian people while trying to strike deals with the oligarchs in his country and Western capital. But but importantly, I do think refused to denationalize vital oil reserves. And I think that is where the relationship broke down. So 
be real, let alone when you're talking about Trump, who, again, as all resistance people constantly rightly say, is a racist monster who has no human concern for anybody. So the notion that all of a sudden it's like Trump just it's like, yeah, I mean, I don't care. But when it comes to Venezuela, there's a lot of tens there. I really care about their well-being. If he cared about their well-being, incidentally, why is he deporting so many Venezuelans back to this hellhole? I mean, you think Venezuela is not part of this white supremacist war on people of color from Donald Trump's ICE regime? I mean, God, it's like in another context, I'll quote Ehud Olmert, like, why are you being naive? (laughs) Well, I think this is the year when people have to say the quiet parts out loud and they have to say what they really mean and what they really believe about things. And this is another one of those instances where you can't be a fence sitter. There are two choices. There's uh, Guaido, a representative of neoliberalism and the ruling class that's going to impose further suffering, much worse than the Venezuelan people have seen so far. And there's Maduro, which is the other choice, which every leftist that I've spoken to from Venezuela has some form of critical support for Maduro because he's better than the alternative. Well, and also, again, even I agree with that and lift sanctions. I mean, that's the other thing, too, is if you wanted an organic process where you could allow for a possibility of a left opposition to emerge without being suppressed, as it has been inside the Bolivarian movement by Maduro, you would lift sanctions, which is the primary cause. I mean, there's no doubt that there's a huge amount of corruption and mismanagement in the Venezuelan government, but the sanctions are overwhelming. You could actually contribute to an open society in Venezuela and the emergence of movements that are still democratic and autonomous inside this left formation yeah, power to the communes which could win right and that could actually be an alternative power source but of course it's literally the last thing that the united states government or even you know of course obviously you know again not good faith people in venezuela who are and i know you know i it's not i know people who's like no they don't support the opposition but they don't support maduro because it's Things are not good, right? Fine. Uh, But they don't support U.S. intervention and they don't support Guaido, period. Uh, But, you know, it goes without saying that there's the oligarchs and U.S. foreign policy do not want a democratic opposition to restore the Bolivarian movement. They want a right wing pliant client state where all of the problems will get even worse. I mean, you you think. That a right wing Venezuelan U.S. backed government is going to be, oh, it's like, oh, yeah, we should really, we should clean up the cartel stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, U.S. foreign policy in Latin America is known for cracking down on military abuses and drug trafficking. That's something you'll learn if you study U.S. history in in, uh, Venezuela. So I think, yeah, the best case is to have a a critical engagement and understand the Bolivarian movement and drill into Venezuela and think critically about it. But honestly, you could just, if you want to, you could just save yourself some time and say, I oppose a coup and an invasion, period. (laughs) There's actually nothing more on a functional political level that you have to do. Yep. Because that's the bottom line right now. And this is another area where Bernie Sanders is far and away the best candidate for president. Because and Tulsi Gabbard's he, done the right noises on this, too. Sure. In this case, I got to give it He understands that. this stuff. He stands against meddling in Latin American countries. He knows the history. And, you know, a lot of the other candidates don't really have a foreign policy. And if you don't have a foreign policy, guess what your foreign policy in office is going to be? 100%. It's going to be the bipartisan neocon consensus that has already done so much damage to the world. Precisely. Yeah, it's going to be all those um, like liberal foreign policy people who were surprised at the negative reaction Elliot Abrams got. Yeah, yeah it's just like, I know Elliot Abrams. We have coffee together. He's nice. He's How a nice man. Oh, he covered up a massacre where they literally drank children's blood. It was, rem- it was the Cold War. It was remarkable seeing the people who have built followings of like liberal left people, but they're part of the blob completely caught off guard that people might have issues with Elliot Abrams. Like that is, that's as terrifying as anything I've saw like this year. There is such a thing as cognitive capture. It isn't all material. There's also genuinely, as Sam Harris would say, there's bad beliefs. You're calling...